All right, we are getting started with the GH4 Q&A session. Um, today we're going to be talking obviously about the GH4. I'm going to be taking your questions and I'm going to do my best to moderate this. I've never done one of these before, so I was going to do a post and make a big deal out of it, but I was like, eh, screw it, let's just knock it out. So we have a bunch of people in here. I see Dave Dugdale. How's it going, Dave? Um, and I already have a lot of questions, so I suppose I will jump straight in. Um, right here, we have a question from Caleb Cook. This is uh, His question is, how does it do in low light? I haven't tested it with low light, and I will say um, I've had the camera for a couple days. It came from b and I have a review unit, um, and I haven't had a lot of time to uh, play with it. I have done some 4K footage and stuff, but um, I've been moving to a new studio, so it's been a little crazy, so I haven't really had a chance to really fully test it. Um, so the low light will have to come later. I am going to see if I can have b and send me a C100 for a couple of weeks so I can kind of compare the two because that's kind of going to be the standard for low light and we're going to see how it holds up against that. So um, let's go on to another question. GH4 versus Sony A7S. Um, that's a great question, very relevant one. I haven't played with the G, or I'm sorry, the Sony A7S. I played with it a little bit at NAB. Um, my, really when it comes to the two, I was more interested in the GH4 for a couple reasons. Number one was the body. Um, I know I'm going to use this camera a lot. It's going to be put through a lot. It's going to be my main camera system. So I wanted a body that was going to hold up and do well um, in most shooting environments, and the GH4 is just built like a tank. It, it really, they've done a great job, the weather sealing and everything. If you work with the GH3, you kind of know how it feels and stuff. So having played a little bit and handled just a little bit the Sony, um, it is a great camera, and it has a lot of great things going for it, but I just don't know if it's going to be as tough when it comes to lots of different shooting environments. Um, the next thing really is sensor size. Obviously, this is going to have a much smaller sensor. Um, my, I was really not into that. That's why I've never really done GH3 content or any Panasonic content because I never really liked that format. But with that sweet speed booster from Metabones, we kind of have a solution to that. Um, so that, you know, if you've got to have the full frame, and I, don't get me wrong, I'm going to miss full frame, you know, leaving the... Um, you know, Canon side with something like this, the Canon 6D, but, you know, I've had the 70 and I'm fine with that sensor size and I can make that work, so, but I definitely am going to be using speed boosters, uh, at least one on one of the cameras, so that's something to think about. The other big thing is in-camera 4K, so this you can record onto the car, 4K, works brilliantly, I've already done it, uh, filmed some with some 4K, it worked great. Um, whereas the Sony, you're going to need an external recorder, and I'm just I'm really getting tired of having four million boxes uh, and different things attached to the camera. Um, so that kind of answers that question is to the best of my ability. Let's look at some other stuff here. Um, Canon 70D or GH4, probably GH4. Um, you're not going to be spending that much more to move up, and uh, with a speed booster, you're going to have the same sensor size, but you get 4K. Let's look here at some other ones. Is the GH4 good enough for filming? Oh, it got pushed down. Is it good enough for filming weddings for fast action and low light? Um, I haven't tested low light yet, so I can't really speak to that. I'm sure it'll do pretty darn good when you compare it to the APS-C size sensors from Canon, so the Rebels, the, the um, 70D. I don't know if it's going to keep up with something like a 6D or a 5D Mark III, We'll find out soon. Um, fast action, you betcha. It's going to do a great job. And the beauty is, you know, a lot of wedding guys are using the 6D, and it works. Um, it gets the job done. Excuse the siren. It's always crazy traffic. Um, but there's a lot of things that don't really work terribly well. You're not going to get the flip out, whereas you have the flip out on here. If you're doing outdoor wedding stuff, you're going to have to get a loop for the back of the screen so you can actually see what's happening. Whereas the GH4, uh, they've updated the OLED and the viewfinder, and it is awesome. I love this so much. Having been a Canon guy, it's so nice to have a built-in, really high-quality uh, viewfinder in the eyepiece. And it just has some other great stuff, peaking, all this stuff that Canon doesn't have. So I think it's going to do a really good job 
for wedding stuff. <clears throat> is it good enough for feature films and big screen? Oh, it definitely. Um, that 4K, I'm going to be putting some test footage up, but I was just I just filmed a little bit on Saturday, and I was just blown away with the sharpness, the quality of it. It's really, really in, incredible. Um, from Dave Dugdale, will Caleb use his this for his A camera? Um, will his Canon bodies be used for B cameras? Um, I am a wholehearted believer in picking one camera system and using that for all of your cameras. Uh, if you mix cameras, it can be kind of difficult to match everything in post. Even within the same brand, you can have some issues. So, for instance, um, you know, I, I heard this. I've experienced it because I had a 70, Canon 70, and it didn't really match up with my Canon 60, even though they're both, you know, the same brand. So it can be really difficult. I had a Sony NEX 5N at one point, and it just, it, it was great. It was a great little camera, but it just never really fully matched. So... For me, I like to have two of the same camera um, for when I do, because I need at least two cameras for interviews and things. So I'm going to be doing two GH4s, and uh, the Canons are kind of... I'm going to keep Canons, so if you're a Canon guy, don't worry. I'm going to keep doing Canon content. I'm going to keep the 6D, but for most of my production work, it's going to be two gh 4 so they match well. All right, would you recommend using the AV attachment for Panasonic or using the wooden camera and external recorder for a 100-bit 4K. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see how the wooden camera fits into that. Would you recommend using AV attachment? Um, from Christian, I'm not sure exactly what your question is, um, but from what I can see, uh, am I going to use an attachment for recording 4K? Am I going to record in camera? I'm probably going to be recording a lot in camera. Uh, just because it's so easy, and it does really look amazing. Uh, I am really interested interested in the Atomos uh, Shogun recorder, the 4K recorder, so I can see where that could be a uh, where I want to use an external recorder, and it depends on the production. For my video podcasts, I'm going to keep shooting at 1080p. You know, that's kind of silly to be shooting 4K. Um, if I was going to do a feature film and be pouring a ton of money into it, I would probably consider looking at uh, external recorders. All right, let's see. Let's see, let's see. Find another comment that I haven't seen. Let's say I'm using a 60... This is from uh, Lorenzo. Let's say I'm using a 64 gigabyte SD card and shooting in Cinema 4K. How much video do you think I can get out of it? Um, I haven't done enough tests, but you can pretty much do the math. Um, but I will be doing a lot more tests to see how much you can fit on there. Right now, I have two SanDisk cards. Uh, the U3s, and um, I think they're around 40 bucks a pop, two 16 gig cards, and I haven't come close to filling up the first one, but I haven't really filmed a lot, so I don't think you're going to see that much of a jump, but a 64 gig card, you could record a lot, so I don't think that's going to be a huge issue. Do you think, this is from Shutter Brother, do you think light reflectors are worth investing in? Uh, if so, would you recommend a circular rectangle? Uh, not a GH4 question, but this is open to whatever. Um, and uh, definitely, uh, you can't go wrong with those reflectors. You can get them really cheap and um, use them for all kinds of stuff. Square versus round, depends on what you're doing. Uh, the big rectangle ones are great, um, but the round ones are nice because they pack down really small. So you can get both for under 50 bucks, depending on where you get it. All right, let's keep looking... Uh, another, will this work on a big screen? Hey, DSLRs work decent on a big screen, uh, and so 4K on a GH4 is, is going to look brilliant. Uh, let's see, keep the questions going, guys. I'm seeing, um, try to scroll down here, see if I can find some new stuff. Ah, here we go. This is a good question um, from John Adams. What do you recommend lens wise? Have you used any Panasonic lenses? Any word on active adapters for Canon EF glass? This is a great question because for me, this camera system, that was the biggest thing holding me back was lenses. So we have, um, obviously, Panasonic lenses, and I have a couple here that are going to be part of my review. The first is the Olympus um, 12-40 to f2.8. You can get a Panasonic version that just it doesn't have quite as much range. It goes to 35. Um, these are tiny, too. Uh, they're great. So... That's kind of, this is going to give you that 24 to 70, and I, I love how small it is when you compare it to, this is the Tamron 24 to 70. 
Um, it's just great. The size is really nice. This one is built much nicer than the Panasonic version. You get five more millimeters, and um, it's fully metal, just a really nice tank of a lens. Um, if you're looking for primes, the Volt Lander, Volt Lander, whatever they're called, these primes are amazing. I used a couple of them when I did the uh, Pocket Cinema camera review and really like them. Um, they're tanks, the body is really nice, uh, the build is great, and it's down to 0.95 for your aperture, so you know, great for low light and uh, getting that shallow depth of field. Uh, they are a little expensive. But that's just Micro Four Thirds stuff. We haven't talked about you know adapting everything, and um, I've pretty much committed to this camera, even though I've only had it for a couple of days. So I've already started to sell a bunch of Canon lenses, and I've been working toward getting a full set of these Nikon zooms. These are the AFS ED lenses. Uh, I want to do this for a couple reasons. One. I can go to any camera with these lenses because the, the Nikon F mount is one of the most flexible mounts for other cameras. Uh, and I can use the speed booster. So this gets me you know, to a 28 to 70 on an APS-C size sensor or Super 35. Great lenses. They're built like tanks. I can do a cine mod on these uh, easily. So that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to be solely shooting on the GH4 in the future. So if I have a dock coming up and I want to try, you know, some C100s, I can rent two of those and still use all this glass. So think about that when you're choosing lenses. Um, you could stay cheap and light by doing the Panasonic stuff, but you won't be able to use those on larger sensor cameras. Um, as for that question regarding EF, two micro four thirds active, uh, you can get, you can easily get your Canon glass on these cameras, the Micro Four Thirds cameras, with an adapter. The issue is you're getting a huge crop factor. It's about two, I believe, two times. So your 100 millimeter is a 200 millimeter. Your 50 is a 100 millimeter. Um, the mic, the Metabones adapters, which for people that don't know, takes the Micro Four Thirds, turns it into a Super 35 or APS-C size sensor and gives you an extra stop of light. It's crazy stuff. They're kind of expensive. This one, I believe, uh, the Nikon to Micro Four Thirds was $400, $430. Totally worth it in my mind. Um, so you can do that. They have said they're working on a Canon version. I don't know if it's going to be active, um, but I've always wanted to use Nikon zooms, so I went ahead and got this one, which is available. And... Um, I don't know how long it's going to be. They said they've been working on one for a long time to go from Canon EF to Micro Four Thirds. I don't know when we're going to see it, to be honest. Um, so those are some lens options, but think about that. You know, what are you going to use in the future? And at the end of the day, if you want to stay small and light, I mean, look how tiny this is. This is ridiculous. So if you want to keep that size and stay really light, you could get these lenses. They're going to resell very well. Uh, it's just flexibility. So if you think you might be using some other cameras, or if you already have Canon cameras you don't want to get rid of, you're going to want to think about what lenses you're going to do. All right, that was kind of a long answer, but it's an important one. Let's look at some other questions. Um, how does the look? How does the footage look when scaled down to full HD? Do you use post cropping or zooming uh, with full HD often? Greetings from Germany, Robin. Um, I haven't been doing a lot of 4K zooming in post or cropping in post. Um, it depends on what your project is. If you're doing stuff for the web and you just want the flexibility of being able to crop, then that's fine because you know that that project going to the web, like my show for instance, that would be that would make a lot of sense. I'm not going to repurpose that show for a film or something and be projecting it or whatever. But it's kind of a bad habit to be doing a lot of uh, 4K cropping because let's say, you know, the day you do a feature film and you film it all in 4K and you do a lot of cropping in post for different angles and different, you know, focal lengths. Um, but then one day, you know, a producer or a studio or whatever requires or asks for that whole project in 4K, then you're kind of screwed because you produced it with the end goal of having a 1080p, you know, uh, video that lets you crop things. So think about that. You know, you don't, you don't want to do that too much. So I haven't been doing much of that. That said, 4K scale down looks incredible. So um, I'm really looking forward to getting some of this footage up. 
So you can take a look at 4K on YouTube, and then you can take a look at the same shots, 1080p scaled. Um, but it, it does do a great, great job. So um, scaling looks, looks fantastic. How does your computer handle 4K? This is from, oh, lost his name. How do you, how does your computer handle 4K? Do you need a beast of a PC to handle the content or have a modest setup to manage? Um, I was really surprised actually. It also depends on your workflow. So I have, right now I'm working with an iMac. Um, can't remember the year, but it's a quad i7 with 16 gigs of RAM. I think the, it's 2.8 or 3 gigahertz. Um, so it's, you know, in today's world, it's fairly old by now, but uh, it's worked really well. So I've edited, you know, one layer of 4K and hadn't had any hiccups or issues. Um, the playback was a little hiccupy with the final raw, you know, uncompressed file that I exported. Um, but there's some ways you can get around it. If you even have an older computer, you can still make this work. As long as you have a hard drive space, you can, like, for instance, I use Final Cut X. You can import all your footage and then create transcoded or uh, proxy media, edit your whole project in proxy, and that's going to be a joke because it creates another file to edit with, and then when you finally export, it'll still give you the 4K, but you're going to not deal with trying to edit full 4K footage multiple layers or whatever. So um, I was really surprised and very encouraged because I was hoping I could make this computer work for me for another year or so. So that was very encouraging, um, not nearly as crazy as an issue. Uh, and I think that's partially due to um, obviously the software, but also being having that you know lower bit rate 4K if you compare this to an external recorder or you know red red workflow requires quite a beast. So um, you can make it work. Um, if you get a chance to rent the camera, you could try uh, and see see what you can do with your computer. All right, let's see more questions. More questions. Uh, some people joined recently. They're asking about low light. Um, still haven't tested that fully. I think it'll do well. I don't think it'll do C hundred level well, but I think it'll do a pretty good job. Which Nikon lens do you recommend? with the speed booster, primes or zooms? That's kind of a you know personal preference, whether you want to shoot with primes or zooms. I found, I know primes are really the hot thing, but I found I've really been enjoying shooting with zooms. And um, you can get plenty of shallow depth of field. And most of the time when I do interviews, I'm shooting at F4 anyway. So uh, the zooms have been great. So the three zooms, I've got one more on the way, but the three zooms I've been working with is the Nikon 28 to 70 AFS and a Nikon 80 to 200 f2.8 um, ED lens. Both, you know, they look the same. They're all like in the same line from Nikon. And then finally, the AFS Nikon 17 to 35. So that gives me the entire range. Really, you know, sexy manual lenses that can work on anything. Um, and then from there, you could do prime. So uh, if you're looking for really fast prime, this is the Nikon 50 millimeter or 55 millimeter at 1.2. This is the cheapest 1.2 lens you can get. Um, so you know, getting a bunch of these primes would do great as well. Um, or save a ton of money and do the Rokinon glass. Get a Nikon mount, grab your speed booster, and you're good to go. So. Um, those would probably be what I do. AIS primes, if you're going to do primes. Uh, zooms, get the AFS ED lenses. Just make sure whatever Nikon lens you get, you have the manual aperture so that you can use you know, it on any non-Nikon body. And the Rokinon stuff. So those are all, those are all great. All right, let's see. Um, I do have a question from YouTube that was posted earlier, and it was a really good question, and that was choosing between the uh, GH4 and the Canon 60. So that's a great question. A lot of people are upgrading maybe from something like a T5i or something like that, and they're trying to choose between a full-frame Canon and a GH4. Um, and it really comes down to a couple things. First, 4K. If you really don't care about 4K and you're just, you know what, I just wanted to 1080p, then, you know, obviously this is going to be a little higher on that list. 
Uh, full frame is a big deal too if you really want full frame. And ask yourself, are you going to be shooting stills on this camera? Because if I was just a still shooter, I would definitely go with a Canon full frame camera. You just can't beat the full frame. But with those video features on the GH4, being able to use a speed booster, having all that lens flexibility, um, I would definitely lean toward the GH4 over something like a full frame Canon. So, um, you know, and you're going to save some money too because the GH4 is uh, 1700 and that's, you know, spend a little more and you'd be getting the Canon 60. All right. Um, let's see. I'm going to see if I can organize this a little better. I'm trying to find some new. Okay, here we go. Here's a new question. How well does continuous autofocus work in video mode? Is it on par with the Canon 60 dual pixel technology? That's a good question. I haven't done um, autofocus tests in video mode, um, but from I, th I think I had it on at one point, and it, and it worked really well. Well, whether it keeps up with the Canon 70D, I can't really answer that question fully. Um, but uh, on the still side, it's it's unbelievable. I can't even find something to compare it to. Um, just the other day, I was snapping some photos, and the, the autofocus is out of control fast on this camera for stills. So video continuous, not quite sure. Um, so I'll definitely make sure I address that in the final review. Okay, here's a good question. How does the quality of the GH4 compare with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera compared to the 70D? 70D is off the table. It's not going to keep up with the other two cameras. Um, GH4 versus Blackmagic. Uh, because the GH4 has that 4K, it really does have a leg up. It doesn't have RAW, though, which the Pocket Cinema camera does have. So if you know what you're doing with RAW, you can pull off a lot with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera. Um, if you compare them side by side, would you really see a big difference? I don't think so. And because of that, I would lean toward the GH4 because you have a gazillion features, stupid little things like being able to format your card in the camera. That's ridiculous that you don't have that on the Blackmagic. But you do have that on this camera, peaking, you know, all this other stuff, um, and having a camera that's completely ready to rock and roll without a bunch of accessories, having a flip-out screen, a screen that you can actually see kind of in the daylight, um, the, the eyepiece, everything. So that's... That's really pushes it over um, the black magic. So if you want that tiny, tiny, tiny form factor, pocket cinema cameras do gonna do the job. All right, let's see. Find a new uh, question. Here's a good one. Lorenzo asks, I know the depth of field on a micro four, th micro four third sensor isn't as smooth as a crop or even a full frame camera. Uh, people keep asking questions and bumping it down. Shoot. Uh, but essentially, you know, thinking about depth of field, are we going to see a big difference? Um, oh, here, here it is. Um, sorry, guys. I'm trying to find the question. There it is. I know the depth of field on a micro four third sensor isn't as smooth as a crop sensor or even a full frame camera, but is the Rokinon 16T 2.2? If I use that lens, the Rokinon 16 2.2, um, how do you think the Boko would fare? I think it's going to work really well, uh, especially if you use that speed booster, give you, you know, yourself a little more field of view. Uh, it's a 16 millimeter, so it's pretty wide. I don't know what camera you're using it on now, but um, depth of field really isn't an issue. And, you, and when I put up some footage, you'll really be able to see you're going to get some great depth of field. It's not going to be a full frame camera depth of field, but that really comes down to your lenses and, you know, focal lengths and things like that. But having shot with it, with I shot 70 and crazy shallow depth of view. I was filming my dog out on our deck and, uh, you know, definitely not going to be a problem. Um, if you like to have almost impossible shallow depth of field, then, you know, obviously looking at a full frame, but um, I haven't, I haven't shot with it and thought, you know what, I really missed the full frame and the child of the field from there. All right. Let's look for some new questions here. Have you tested the GH4 against the 5D Mark III RAW with Magic Lantern? Um, I have a 
Canon 60 and a Canon 5D Mark II, and I don't use Magic Lantern a lot, so uh, I haven't done that test. Um, I will tell you, though, when you shoot on the RAW with the Canon 5D Mark III, you've probably noticed there's a lot of more ray, which is another question. I don't know if anyone asks, and we can get to that in a second. Um, so there's some artifacts and some weird stuff, much less the crazy workflow. Um, I have filmed some various different shots of the GH4, and it's the detail is incredible. So even though you don't have raw, you know there's a little more flexibility with what you can do in post without tearing your footage up. Um, but the detail is out of this world incredible. I mean, I filmed a very deep depth of field wide shot of the city from a window, and I noticed things. I I looked at that view a million times, and I noticed things from the footage that I never even noticed with my own eyes, just little details. I noticed there were tiny garages with people walking around way in the distance that I'd never seen before. It's a, it's really incredible. It really is unbelievable. So um, I definitely think that's going to be uh, a great contender. Again, it just comes down to sensor size. And uh, to kind of take that question to another level, you know, when would you choose full frame over this camera? And um, having done a lot of you know, commercials or uh, commercial type work or promos where you're in people's offices doing interviews, that full frame is really nice. When you're in a super cramped tight area, um, it's going to be easier to use a full frame camera. And so if you do a ton of that stuff, maybe you need to look at Canon or the new Sony. Um, but I think depending on the lens and using that speed booster, you could definitely make the, uh, the GH4 work. All right. Let's see. I'm trying to find a new question here. Keep asking them. Definitely keep the questions going. Okay, here we go. Is it good for stills? Um, yes. It's it's autofocus wise. It's crazy crazy talk on this camera. It, the autofocus is out of control. So that's great. Um, would I choose it exclusively for stills over something like a Canon full frame? No. Um, that's one of the reasons we're keeping this is my wife and I do photography um, you know, on and off and I would much rather shoot on a full frame camera than the GH4 just because it, you know, that's where Canon shines, right? So they, they really know their stuff when it comes to stills and that full frame is just, just beautiful. Um, so Probably not if you're exclusively doing stills. If you're going to be doing a lot of video and some stills, then yeah, the GH4 will take really good care of you. Um, next question. Would you choose a GH4 as a cinematic A-cam over the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera? Definitely. For sure. No question. Um, the only reason I would choose the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera over the GH4 would be if I wanted to you know, run with the smallest, tiniest camera package I could possibly get, then I would go for that. Or if I wanted that in or raw. Um, but with the new Shogun, we're going to have the, the capabilities of recording raw off of the camera. So let's see. What kind of computer specs is needed to handle 4K? 4K in general, you're going to need a nicer computer but you can kind of hack things together with, you know, the combination of recording on the cards on this camera. And, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, my computer isn't the craziest thing. It's a quad core i7 with 16 gigs of RAM. It's, it worked great uh, for what I've done so far. So um, if you have the money, obviously a Mac Pro from Apple would be your best bet for that. Um, but, you know, you can make it work, especially if you do that proxy stuff. How do, how do you compare it with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera in terms of range, sharpness, color, and overall convenience and run and gun as well as studio productions? Uh, as for studio productions and convenience, the GH4 is incredible. And I, I, to put this, you know, honestly, I haven't been more excited about a camera in a, since I got my first DSLR. Like, you know, with shooting Canon stuff, it's been nice, it works, gets the job done, but 
it hasn't been nearly as exciting as playing with this camera. And I know, you know, obviously you shouldn't base your <laughs> your filming off of how excited you are about tech or, or cameras, but um, I'm more excited about shooting because of this camera and the capabilities. And just, you know, it's like if you drive or commute to work every day and you have a terrible car, when you upgrade, it's it changes your life because it just makes life easier. So just stupid little things like having a um, headphone jack, recording audio straight to the camera, peaking, you know, all this stuff. The EVF makes a huge difference in how you shoot. changes everything. It's, it's a game changer, in my opinion, coming from this thing with a honking magnetic loop on here, and then it's the pixels aren't really built for that and all this kind of thing. So um, I think it's a great camera. It definitely shuts down the pocket cinema camera for that reason. Dynamic range. I haven't really pushed the footage yet, um, but from what little I've played with, you, you can play with the footage a lot without running into issues. You know, before on a Canon 60, you start to change contrast a little bit and the footage just falls apart. So this camera seems to be handling that better. Uh, color, color looks great. Um, I am looking forward to comparing it to the Canons, because I know that's Canon's strong suit. They've been in this industry for so long. And I really agree with um, Shane Hurlbut's comments on color and skin tones and things, which Canon uh, does a great, great job with. So um, that's definitely um, something to consider. I'm really looking forward to, I'm hoping to not only review the camera, but I want to do a full guide on how to use this camera, lenses, all that stuff. And I also want to do a series of videos comparing it to other cameras. So what does this look like against the Pocket Cinema camera? What does this look like against uh, a 5D Mark III, C100? Because each of these cameras has their own strong suit. So I'm really looking forward to comparing all that stuff. Okay, let's see. So that kind of answers some other people's questions about uh, bit depth. Um, you can, you know, get up to 10 bit if you record externally. So that'll be cool to check out. How have you found navigating the GH4 menu settings after being on Canon systems? That's a great question. Um, and it has been pretty easy, actually. At first, it was a little weird because, um, obviously, it's a different camera system. But they really did do a great job. I actually prefer the button layout on the top and the back of the camera. Um, Canon's cameras, they're all a little different. If you're working with a Rebel or 5D Mark III, and then the 60 is its own category of you know, different uh, button layout. Uh, I will be doing a part of a, the, one of the videos will be looking at menus because there are a couple things that you're playing with a camera. You're like, what the heck is this doing? Why is it playing with exposure or um, issues with that? And so it's just getting used to names being different. So Canon might call, you know, shooting without uh, an electronic lens one thing, whereas Panasonic calls it something else. But I would not be worried about um, switching and being confused. Yeah, so I probably in total played with the camera for maybe three hours and uh, pretty quickly in the first half hour started to really get a hang of how things work. So so that's not really a, a big issue. All right. Will you test the YAC interface unit? Um, I originally was going to have the YAC unit come in with all the gear to review. Uh, I ended up switching that because I'm not going to be purchasing it, and I'm almost, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that I'm going to tell B&H they can't have these cameras back, and I'm going to buy them off of them, uh, just because I'm ready to make that switch. And um, so I will be getting it in. Um, would I recommend to buy it? It depends on a couple things. First of all, it's a lot of money. It's two grand for, you know, that box. So, um, and I'm not really even sure how high quality that whole XLR audio system is. I don't know if it would be as good as something like a Juice Link. So you might be able to save the money and just get a Juice Link um, little, you know, preamp box. Uh, unless you're going to be doing a ton of SDI stuff, then it's a no-brainer. Go ahead and upgrade. Uh, I was originally excited about that because I'd be able to easily adapt um, to different battery systems. But I'm not really crazy about the four pin, um, and you can't stick batteries in there. You have to power it externally. So it's really not the best solution uh, unless you need to do a lot of SDI. So I, I hope to review it. Um, I'm not going to really buy one, I don't think, though. So 
it's a lot of money for 2XLR and, and SDI. All right, looking for new comments. And the reason I'm not answering these super fast is Google isn't organizing this by newest. It's organizing it by rating, so they're just they're all over the place. First time doing this, so I apologize for how ridiculous my uh, moderation has been. Okay, here's a new one. How do you set your picture style on a Canon when not planning on color correcting in post? Um, so that's a Canon question. I'll also answer it with the GH4. Um, I try to avoid standard. You can shoot standard, and I, I do shoot with it on and off. Um, the biggest thing I don't like about standard is the sharpening it adds. That really adds to the horribleness of moray and aliasing on the Canon DSLRs. So in general, I shoot with neutral. Um, maybe use neutral and bump up the contrast a little bit, um, but trying to keep that sharpness down and can really help you if you're struggling with the uh, um, the aliasing issues. Will you build a new rig? This is a good question, again, from Lorenzo. Will you build, be building a new rig for your GH4? If so, what will it consist of? This, you know, looking back a little bit, before NAB, I was ready to make the move to a GH, or I'm sorry, uh, C100. I was, I was sold on the whole C100 thing, but then the GH4 was announced, and hearing more about it, I got really excited, and... Um, one of the big things, aside from sensor, and I'm going to be talking about all this in future content, you know, NDs, there's built-in NDs on the C100, so I have a solution for dealing with that on the GH4. Uh, sensor size, that's fixed with the Metabones adapter. The other thing was um, rigging. So it's a completely different form factor, the C100. So I had to kind of have to rethink how I deal with things there, and I really don't feel like, you know, dealing with a big switch when it comes to rigging that's where the GH4 really came in handy because I can still use all my existing, you know, DSLR form factor gear on this camera. And this is a tiny setup, but, you know, I've hung this honking lens on there and uh, it's worked great. So this camera can literally pop into my cages and I'm done. There's nothing else I need to purchase. It just perfectly, seamlessly um, works right with everything else. So... Um, probably not going to be doing anything new. Um, the only addition I'm looking at is going to be a ways out, but I just put up on my website a post about this box, this thing called the Lunchbox, and it has battery power solutions and audio solutions in one box. So instead of getting a power plate with batteries hanging off of it and your juice link and stuff, this is all in one box. Um, so that'll be an addition, uh, but that's I, that just got funded on Kickstarter, so we'll see how that works down the road. This is a good question from Ronald. What flavor of 4K it records onto the SD cards, and what is the option for recording to external recorder, and is it via HDMI? What kind of HDMI? Okay, so HDMI on the camera, it's the mini HDMI. There's so many HDMIs, I'm trying to remember exactly, but it's the little tiny D-shaped HDMI. Uh, if you just go to any site with spec sheets or even my site, you'll be able to find that. You can get, you know, the cables for pretty cheap. Um, recording flavors on a camera, you can uh, do 4K at 100 bits or megabits or whatever. Um, that works really well. I've been really happy with that. Um, card, I'll show you the card because Panasonic's going to be releasing their own card. I'm not sure if it's out yet, but uh, I've been using this guy right here, the Sandus Extreme Pro. 280 megabytes a second, um, U3. So that was $40 or so, and you can tell it's crazy and different because of all the extra um, kind of pins on the back or whatever those are called. Um, that's These have been flawless so far for me, and they're going to be a lot cheaper than the Panasonic one from what I've seen. So that's for recording internally. Externally, right now, to my understanding, unless someone just recently put something out there, the only 4K external recorder is the Shogun from Atomos. And um, I'm really excited about that because not only does it record 4K, but it gives you raw recording from the camera. And that's through HDMI or HDSDI. So that's going to be around two grand, but it's one of those things you buy it and it's going to work for any camera. 4K, 1080p, it's a great monitor, has a gazillion... 
um, features with it. So uh, another question, is 4K video less noisy than 1080p? Also, does the noise structure, how does the noise structure compare to the GH2? I haven't shot with the GH2. I've played with the GH3 a little bit, so I'm, I'm probably not the greatest person to answer that. Um, if you go to SLR Lounge, they've done a post where they compare the GH4 to the GH3 with stills and noise. Um, pattern doesn't bother me. It's, it's not, if anything, it's more of a fine grain than it is on the Canon DSLRs. And the question's gone. I'm trying to remember what the other part of it was. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much too much about that. Uh, let's see, another question. I'm probably gonna wrap up in the next four minutes or so. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to have to figure out how to do a better job of moderating all this stuff. Okay, here's a new question. GH4 or C100 for live music, low light events? Probably the C100. Um, I haven't tested it, but the C100, having played with it, and while I was at NAB, I helped Jem Schofield from the C47 do a bunch of post-production world um, content. He has two C100s, and so I played with it in the past, but I had a lot of time with it over that weekend before NAB, and it really is just straight up mind blowing how low light you can go with that camera, or how high ISO, I should say. And it not only helps with low light, but you can do really cool things like um, do a lot of bounce lighting, and then it's going to soften up your light, but it's also going to lose a lot of light. But because that camera is ridiculous, you can just jack the ISO, and you pretty much don't have to worry about it until it gets into numbers that you are struggling reading. It's just crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, <laughs> let's see. Are there many examples on the web about how the GH4 in 4K beats all others in detail? How does it perform at 1080p without going into the whole 4K workflow? Um, so far, I can't help myself but only film in 4K um, just because I, I'm still tripping on that 4K resolution in detail. But um, 1080p, it's going to do a fantastic job. And uh, unless you're going straight to the web and doing show or something event style, um, I don't see why you couldn't just film in 4K and downscale. Um, but uh, yes, it's going to, if you don't want to deal with the 4K thing, you can just get the camera and you're good to go. Doing great 1080p work. And uh, if you want to dabble in 4K, you can. So even, even if you take 4K off the table, this camera is incredible and uh, does a great job with a lot of things. So, uh, Let's see. I'm going to try switching to a different view, see if I can get some, some new comments here. All right. Is it cinematic? Yes. Um, that's actually an interesting question. There's been a lot of talk about um, whether or not this, you know, a lot of people think that it looks very video-y, and that really comes down to, you know, picture styles, post work, lenses, and lighting. Um, so, you know, for those that are kind of worried about that, uh, don't don't worry about it because the camera does a great job. Um, this lens, that zoom lens from Nikon, with the speed booster on the camera with, you know, natural light, but trying to keep things soft and doing a lot of bounce and things, um, did a great job. It looked beautiful. So I'm really happy with that. So the cinematic thing is definitely, uh, you can make it work for sure. Uh, if someone is moving from a GH4 to a GH4 with no previous array of lenses starting absolutely fresh, what would you recommend buying? Panasonic specific lenses or buying well-known lenses and adapters? It depends on your budget and your workflow. So it, as you can see, we talked about this a little bit earlier. See how tiny this is? Like, forget you can take the cage off, whatever. This is really, really small and compact. Um, this is going to be a tiny camera setup. Um, I just like the look of the Nikon glass and the flexibility of having more of them in the future. So um, one safe thing, if you don't want to spend a lot of money to do, 
would be to keep doing manual lenses. So if you go to my website, on the top left, if you look at recommended gear, hover over that, and then under lenses, you should see vintage glass or vintage lenses. There's a huge list. I've done videos on all the different kinds. Um, all of those are going to be able to adapt to this. Um, as of now, because the speed booster, there's not a lot of different models of it, I'd probably be going with Nikon glass because they have a speed booster, and you can even use the newer Nikon G lenses because of this little um, ring on the adapter that lets you change the aperture. So uh, starting fresh, if it was me, if I was starting absolutely fresh and I bought the GH4, I would try to get some Nikon zooms. If you don't have a lot of money and you still want the zooms, um, look at the Nikon 35-70 to 70 f3.5. It's a macro lens, super sharp lens. You can get for around $200 on eBay or uh, KEH. So that's that's a great option as well. All right, folks, we are going to wrap this up. I hate cutting everyone off who hasn't had their questions answered. If you haven't had your question answered, uh, go to the website and send me an email, and I'll do my best to get to you as soon as possible. Um, thanks for being a part of this, I had no idea this many people would join. We have 61 viewers, and I thought we'd have like three. So uh, if you like this, let me know. I'd love to do more stuff like this in the future with gear questions. Um, you can watch this if you're just tuning in. You can watch this live, not live. You can watch the recording on the website. I'll post that or on YouTube. So thank you so much. You guys are the best, and um, that's the reason I do this. It's not, I enjoy it, but um, being able to help you guys out really floats my boat. So have a great day, and I will talk to you guys in the next video.